I grew up about five miles from here in a suburb called Girard. Uh, while we were only a few minutes away from Youngstown, we traveled here about as often as we went to Cleveland or Pittsburgh to see relatives or Boston or Florida for vacation. My earliest memory of coming to Youngstown is from November of 1990. I was six years old and WWF was coming to town. Uh, my dad, my brother, and I were coming. The Ultimate Warrior was slated to wrestle um, the Macho Man Randy Savage at the top of a loaded card that featured the Big Boss Man, Shawn Michaels, Marty Jannetty, the Bushwhackers, everybody who mattered, pretty much except for Hulk Hogan. It was going to be big. So before we came downtown, we stopped at an old Northside hotspot called the Boatyard. It was one of the few places in town you could get seafood that wasn't deep fried. And for some reason on that night, I wanted Cajun scallops. Now, the scallops ended up being a terrible idea as I proceeded to throw them up all over the coat of a man who was sitting next to us on the floor of the Beagley Center, and we had to leave after just three matches. Now, I don't know when the next time was that I came back to Youngstown after that, but for most of the next two decades, I carried the widely held suburban view that the nicest building in Youngstown was the jail. But now I live here. I commute about 20 minutes each day to Canfield from my apartment in downtown Youngstown, about 20 minutes to teach uh, English and high school journalism at Canfield High School, a predominantly white uh, suburban school of about 1,000 students. Now, Canfield has seen a 37% population increase in the 25 years or so since the great Cajun scallop debacle of 1990, while Youngstown has seen a population decrease of about 32%, leaving, or, uh, losing about 30,000 of its residents. Now, we're all aware of the, uh, the dangerous economic effects that these population shifts can have on cities and have had on cities like Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, and Detroit, and the causes are well documented. As industry left, so did the people. But it wasn't until about seven years or so ago when I started to advise high school journalism that I really began to take a look at my city. And even more recently, I began to realize that high school journalism provides an unprecedented opportunity for us to break down the barrier between the suburbs and the city. And I want to talk about that today. There's nothing to do, a typical suburban complaint and something that I said probably hundreds, thousands of times growing up in Girard. But that's not true. We ran through moonlit streets playing hide-and-seek, we rode our bikes to dusty baseball fields for pickup games, and we jumped on giant trampolines in backyards. We built blanket forts in our basements, and when we were old enough, we drove around a lot. Uh, one night, driving around with one of my friends, who was the quarterback of the football team, we were pulled over for speeding, and when the officer recognized his name, he let us go with the friendly, slow down, Mace. Uh, there's a magical, the, the suburbs possess their own mythology, uh, a magical reality beyond reality, and that's what keeps many of us locked inside of them. When Arcade Fire, the band, released their 2010 album, The Suburbs, I was still locked inside. That album distilled everything about the suburban lifestyle, the simple beauty of those nights, those car rides, but also the indefinable sense that there was something more for us out there, something bigger. So in 2010, 2012, I found myself pitching a big idea to my journalism class at Mineral Ridge High School. What materialized were two things. First, the strangest field trip that I've ever been on, and second, a 10-part series called Discovering Youngstown that we published on our website. Now, on an early March morning that year, uh, three cars full of students and I traveled the nine miles or so from Little Mineral Ridge to Youngstown. That day, we ate at Kravitz Deli and interviewed the owners. We went to Charlie Staples Barbecue, interviewed the owners there, toured the Steel Museum, the Butler Art Museum, we walked around downtown through Mill Creek Park, and we even found ourselves on the air of a local radio show that was broadcasting from a studio downtown. After that trip, a student named Leah wrote a piece called Give Her a Chance, a case for discovering Youngstown that we published on our website and in which she wrote the following. My first thoughts about Youngstown were that it is unsafe, dirty, and a scrap of a once great city. 
The staff agreed prior to our journey that Youngstown was not a place that we'd ever really want to go. But we wanted to know why we felt that way. Our trip caused the staff's attitude to change dramatically. We have a new perspective on this city that is so close to home, but feels so far away. We now realize how truly family and business oriented it is. It has its rundown sections, but it also has beautiful new parts. As students, we forget about that. Many of us aren't even aware of it in the first place. At the very least, that trip changed the perspective of Youngstown for 15 students and one teacher, who from that day on were aware of a brand new world just a few minutes away. But it didn't stop there because our website allowed us to pass on those truths to 300 other students and 30 other teachers with cars and money and the ability to make Youngstown a part of their lives. We realized that we could change things. So later that year, when I arrived at Canfield High School, I saw the opportunity increase as the audience grew to about 1,000 students and 60 teachers with families and friends and cars and money. Actually, a lot more money, as Canfield's average household income is about $30,000 more than the state average. That year, a group of ambitious juniors started a column called Dinner with the Editors. The goal was to travel to locally owned restaurants and explore and define Youngstown's food culture. What we found were a few things. Uh, first of all, that roasted chicken is in fact a real thing and that it is very, very good. But also we learned that this kind of work can lead to friendships between people who might not ever otherwise talk to each other. Uh, for those students, during those meals, boundaries were broken. The boundary between Canfield and the wider community, the boundary between band nerds and basketball stars, the boundary between ignorance and openness. Now, at the start of, or before the start of last school year, my principal asked if I was interested in adding a TV program to our journalism program, or a TV show to our journalism program. And like most uh, first year, or my, like most young teachers on a one-year contract, I said yes. Um, and at that point, the, the opportunity widened again as the, as the chance to shoot and edit high-quality video uh, expanded our, our reach. Last year, we shot a series of stories about Youngstown, and they appeared on our website, in the school, in the community, and I'm going to show a clip here that's a mashup of some of those stories. When I say the words downtown Youngstown, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, slums. Slums, definitely slums. Gangs. Ghetto. I think I just like heard a gunshot in my head, but... <laughs> Gary, when I say the words downtown Youngstown, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, great time. While recent decades have seen the steel industry and thousands of residents leave town, life may be finally coming back to Youngstown. The city, which was named one of the top 10 places in America to start a business by Entrepreneur Magazine, has seen a recent business boom particularly restaurants, including the brand new Susie's. Um, the concept is uh, kind of a throwback pinup, um, throwback pinup hot dog shop. We have handcrafted shakes, handcrafted sodas, um, you know, cocktails if you're of age, of course. Uh, we have a, a fantastic array of toppings. Uh, we use a ton of local um, produce, a lot of local uh, purveyors, so, um, you know, just trying to keep our money in Youngstown a little bit. I've seen a lot of people from our own community taking risks um, with their money and their time to try to build um, places in our area that are fun and that um, offer us places to go. From three years ago, today we actually have an environment that is conducive to businesses sustaining and growing. We actually chose this this particular location that we're in now was chosen kind of strategically. We wanted to be between the campus, which is up the stairs over here to the left, and between the downtown entertainment district, which is kind of where you spent the evening. People should come to downtown Youngstown from Canfield because it's not that far, it's not at all scary, and you really need to see what the core of the community is. The suburbs wouldn't exist without the central downtown district, so if we don't have a strong central downtown district, the suburbs are going to fall apart. My husband and I lived in San Francisco for about 20 years, and coffee or good coffee was always kind of a, a commonality. Uh, we had been in high-end food and beverage for many years, so it was a natural for 
progression of a hobby. If you don't have coffee that was roasted, in, unless you've tried freshly roasted coffee, it's just uh, a whole different ballgame. I mean, coffee really should be drunk within two weeks of its roast date, and nobody else is doing that here. And our quality, frankly, is better. A lot of coalitions, especially on the west side, the uh, I Door Neighborhood Association is clean up a lot in their neighborhood. They've got a lot of grants, uh, so they can build like playgrounds, tear houses down, get rid of blight. There's a lot of stuff going on that as far as like you know, taking those lots and turning them into like orchards, turning them into uh, gardens, community gardens. So there's definitely a plus side on that. But I mean, there's so much more we need to do in that regard all, all over the neighborhood. Campfield, essentially being a suburb of Youngstown, was built on the back of the inner city, the greater metropolitan area. So naturally speaking, if you build your, your life as it is thus far in Campfield, you should experience the history, the culture, and, and the tradition that the downtown Youngstown area has to offer. So the, the learning experience those kids had putting those stories together was passed on to our entire audience who viewed them. And again, we broke some boundaries there. A lot of familiar faces. Um, near the end of last school year, I figured it was finally time to figure out if all of this work had actually had any effect on people's perceptions and behaviors. So we surveyed students and teachers. Found that 47% of teachers who uh, responded to our survey, said that they went to at least one place that they saw on our TV show or on our website. Now, 47% is 28 teachers, so that's not too bad. But the real impact is with the students. 69% of student respondents said that they went to at least one place that they saw on our show or on our website. Now, that's about 700 people. That's 700 people with families and friends and cars and money. And did I mention that they have money? So. <laughs> Here's, here's, the, here's the good part. Uh, there are about 1,600 high school teachers in the Tri-County area. That's Trumbull, Mahoning, Columbiana counties. If 47% of those teachers came to Youngstown just five times a year, spending just $10 each time, that would generate about $40,000 in income for local business. But again, the key is with the students. There's about 25,000 high school students in the Tri-County area. If 69% of them came to Youngstown just five times a year, spending just $10 each time, that would be about $900,000 worth of revenue for local businesses. So that's about a million dollars as a result of high school students and teachers breaking the boundary between the suburbs and the city just a few times each year. And that's not counting middle school teachers and students, that's not counting elementary school teachers and their students. It's not counting principals, secretaries, classroom aides, custodians, that's not counting any of their families or friends. There's about 500,000 residents in the Tri-County area, all within the reach of a high school news organization or a district with the manpower to start one, but they just don't have the resources right now. So telling these kinds of stories can change people's minds about cities like Youngstown. It's in the best interest of stakeholders in the community to keep these programs strong and it's in the best interest of those stakeholders to fund new programs in districts where they don't currently exist. But all of this raises some new questions, some important questions. What about the school that can't start a program due to funding or whatever the issue might be? What can we do to get them involved? What about the student who wants to be a part of the journalism program but can't for whatever reason? And how can we possibly integrate these concepts into our core curriculum? So some of my colleagues and I in the English department found at least one answer to these questions this year. We created a project for our AP and Honors English students that allowed us to teach Common Core standards, but also put them in the role of journalists seeking out and exploring the truths about their city and their region. We chose a book, The Hard Way on Purpose, by Akron area writer David Giffels as a summer reading text. This is a, a collection of his essays about growing up in the Rust Belt. Now, reading this book led to amazing discussions with our students. Those discussions led to writing about, uh, about the concepts that he presents, about his writing style, and about our identities as children of the Rust Belt. The centerpiece of this project was a field trip to Youngstown, where we toured the city, spoke to some of the people involved in its revitalization, and ate some of its best food. Uh, we documented that trip on Instagram, and we asked the kids to suggest uses for the vacant and unoccupied spaces that they saw along the way. 
Finally, at the end of the week, the author himself came to the school. He spoke to all of these students, answered questions, and signed books. There were about 250 students, grades 9 through 12, who participated in this project that took boring summer reading and turned it into a transformative experience. For most of them who had never been down here before, the boundary was finally broken. Now, a couple of months ago, a student of mine named Annie, um, she came up to me and asked me if I could give her a list of places in Youngstown that she could go because she wanted to have a Youngstown day with her friend. Now, I don't remember ever considering the idea of a Youngstown day when I was in high school, and I don't imagine she would have either without our project. Uh, students and teachers come up to me all the time to tell me about their most recent Youngstown experience. It's actually becoming cool to go to Youngstown. So finally, uh, as we know, every big idea has flaws, and this one is no different. First, most high schools don't produce student news. And according to a 2011 study done by the Center for Scholastic Journalism at Kent State, only 27% of student news publications actually publish online, and only 8% publish exclusively online. So in other words, we're not reaching students using the media that they prefer most. And if we don't use multimedia and social media, then our message is most likely going to be lost. Second, while I focus primarily on engaging suburban districts, we can't forget about the city's residents who are most directly impacted by the rise and fall of the local economy. So teachers and administrators in urban districts need to expand their media offerings and create collaborative programs with suburban districts if resources aren't available. My student Annie, in an essay she wrote after our trip, uh, wrote the following. If there's one place that knows loss, it's Youngstown. Our hope through loss and disappointment has kept us going. After our trip to Youngstown, I see people who care about the city's future. However, we cannot let these people bear the weight of Youngstown all by themselves. We have to start taking responsibility. That old suburban complaint that there's nothing to do is dead. We all have work to do if we want to reclaim what was lost. But there's no reason why that work can't be fun. There's no reason why it can't be an adventure. There's no reason why we can't be explorers and storytellers. There are people in this city working every day, activists, organizers, incubators, trying to regrow this place. And we owe it to them, to ourselves, and to the future of our city to tell their stories. Thank you.